I'd now like to introduce the Jasper Signature Poetry Prize, um, which is Cameron Stewart. Cameron Stewart is a poet originally from and now back residing in Bethlehem. He attended the Poetry MFA at St. Mary's College of California and has taught writing at SMC and Berkeley. He is the recipient of Judith Butler and Community of Writers Scholarships. Hi, I'm Cameron Stewart and I was the judge for the Young Poets competition this year. Um, a uh, category that was won by Hugo Jurdy uh, for his poem, The Certainty of Your Goodness. Um, I thought I'd share a couple of words about the poem now and also to just say it was a fantastic, fantastic selection uh, of poems that I had to choose from this year. Um, some really, really excellent meditations on formal meter as well as some really experimental works, ones that care deeply and placed in the center of the, of, of their of their poems you know what's going on uh, around the world in a, in a contemporaneous sense now but also ones that journeyed into myth and legend and make believe uh, in order to make their poetic voices known um hugo's winning poem was an extraordinary piece that seemed to really touch on some of the French surrealist poets that I personally have loved reading growing up. Uh, Pierre Reverdy, um, John Ashbury's translations of some of those poets as well. Joyce Mansour is another poet that I mentioned in my uh, write-up for this poem that it reminded me of. And um, the poet has such an amazing way of blending together what feel like these images of natural environment with this sense of magical retransformation. Um, every line in the in this in this poem is 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 memorable um, and feels as though it stands alone and has meaning if it's separated from the rest. Um, it weaves together and feels almost gazelle like, um, and uh, yeah, uh, it is always so cold in the staircase of our names. Love that line. There is a rash in this desert, a wind in your gaze. Um, and uh, the snow beats the measure of our love. All the way through this poem, there is a sense that the natural environment has almost been turned into an, an incantation. Um, and there are so many ways, I think, of reading a narrative into this into this poem, as well as dispensing with that and, and enjoying um, the incredible sort of transformations and juxtapositions that, that feel both romantic and weird and rich and I use weird in a great way um yeah an extraordinary poem and uh very glad to have picked it for my winner so congratulations Hugo and the certainty of your goodness was a very very worthy win this year the certainty of your goodness Last night, a boat came in to Ramadi. Blindfolded with rocks, I dropped my sisters. There was a rash in this desert, a wind in your gaze. Along the edge of your absence, the warm forehead of a child had followed me. It is always so cold in the staircase of our names. Beloved, the word erases the hand. The snow beats the measure of our love, and it is a light which uncovers its shadow at last. My throat knots up, and the pontoon forgets your hand. But you lie down, and the dried blood of my bird comes to huddle against your neck. Braid your tears to the fields that will not come, and whisper this blue star the book is in my wrist. Your tears are in her mind. I would have liked to make a hand to your distress. Your tears are in the muddy. I was so scared you would return. I'd like to thank Cameron Stewart, the judge, um, for choosing me and awarding me the signature prize. This poem happened following two things. Um, the first was reading about and seeing images of the battle that took place in Ramadi in 2006. There is a bridge, a barrage there, of which I could see images on the internet, and I could look at the hands of each person on it. 
The second catalyst was the rediscovery of Virginia Woolf's last letter, um, in which she writes, everything has gone from me, but the certainty of your goodness. Um, she says, you see, I can't even write this properly. I can't read. I can't go on spoiling your life any longer. I don't think any two people could have been happier than we have been. It was very important that Ramadi was not a metaphor. It always seems that there are hands in the world that do the same gesture at the same time, and those hands can never know each other. We next come to the um, signature short story prize judge, Catherine Metzakapa. Catherine is Irish, but now lives in Carrara, between the Aquan Alps and the Tyrrhenian Sea. She writes mainly historical fiction on the themes of love and culture clash. Writing as Katie Hutton, she is the author of The Gypsy Bride from 2020 and The Gypsy's Daughter from 2021, both published by Bonnie Air Zephyr. Her first novel under her own name, Julia of the Albizzi, is impressed with impress books. Her short fiction has been published by the Copperfield Review, Island Zone, Erotic Review, Me First, Asymmetry, Aerial Chart, Turnpike Review, Yours and My Weekly, and also in anthologies. She also writes romance under the pseudonym Kate Zarelli for Ecstasy Books. Her stories have been long listed in competitions by the Writers and Artists Yearbook and the Fiction Desk, and long listed for the 2018 Colin Toybin Short Story Award, and in 2019 for the Do Dorothy Dunnett Prize. She has also published academically in the field of 19th century ephemeral illustrated fiction and in management theory. She is a member of the Irish Writers' Centre, Irish Pen, the Irish Writers' Union, the Society of Authors, the Historical Writers' Association, the Historical Novel Society and the Romantic Novelist Association. She has a Master's in Creative Writing from Canterbury Christchurch University. Hello, I'm Catherine Metzkapper, and it's my great honour to have been asked to judge the 2021 Signature Short Story Prize. I can't help feeling that I do so under rather false pretenses, because although when I was quite a small child, I decided I wanted to be a writer, unlike you who've gone in for the Signature Prize, um, I didn't actually go going into my 40s. So uh, don't do as I, as I um, have done, you know, do as you're doing, really. Um, so I'm in awe of those people who don't just say one day I'm going to do this, but who actually get on with it in the way that you have. Writing is a gift. That doesn't mean that it comes easily, though. You do need to work at it. Um, you need to practice it. Um, and you put that into action because really, if I have any regret, it's that I didn't start earlier. Um, feeling that I had to kind of live in order in order to write, write about that later, but that really is only an, an excuse. One of the things I would say about the quality of the writing that I've seen is, is how mature it is. Um, you know, you'd have to know that people were only within that particular age group and also the originality and the range of the subject matter. And it's mind blowing really to read such accomplished writers, um, knowing that they've got decades more of writing to come. So, in judging this competition, the most difficult thing to do was to choose only one story. I wanted to give so many honourable mentions in addition to, to obviously the prize winner. For instance, there's a story about a terrible haunting of a tower block that Neil Gaiman would have been proud of. Another gave a nod to Kafka with a protagonist desperate to leave his job but unable to find the right person to give his notice to. A third in the magical realism genre had echoes of the great Gabriel Garcia Marquez. And in one story, a protagonist has their work plagiarized by somebody else. The only thing worse for a writer than losing the precious only copy. Revenge for them isn't so much sweet as acidic. So for those of you who haven't been successful this time in the sense of winning the prize, note that you have nevertheless been successful. Writing your story and sending it out into the world to be read as a major milestone. I'll be involved in the judging again next year, and there's no one in this competition whose work I would not look forward to reading in future. The prize, though, goes to Every Room, Every Wall by um, Eamon McEwen. Now, this is an intensely observed tale of a couple who both of, both of them have something to hide, as probably many couples do. 
a seemingly innocuous decision to go to a bookstore sets off a crisis that neither really intended, but somehow both of them wanted. I'm going to be looking out for Eamon McCune, who really is I would be looking out for everybody who's entered this competition, whose work I've read. Because Eamon has an, an eye for the nuances of human relationships and reactions, the fault lines in relationships. This short story is really a work of considerable maturity. I wish I could have written a story like that at his age. In fact, I wish I could write a story like that now. So without more ado, I'm going to introduce Bill Lay, who will read you the winning entry, Every Room, Every War. Sally just had to go to this bookstore. Out of all the bookstores in town, and there were four of them, and one was a big retailer with two floors and a cafe, she chose this one, the smallest and the dingiest, a room of mazy, overstacked shelves and clumsy piles set in random towers about the floor. Anyone could see that this was the worst bookstore out of the available options. Anyone. A blind person. A child. Anyone. Sally was tottering by the shop's entrance. I just want to browse, she said to nobody in particular. It was late Saturday afternoon. The sun was waning, and most people had decided that now was a good time to head home. And here was Dan, rooted to the pavement, watching the sparse scattering of people as they moved and faded on the high street. He looked back at Sally, at her pleading face, and at the deceit buried somewhere inside it, because he knew that Sally didn't want to just browse. Sally, of course, wanted to bump into the poet. I'll wait out here, he said, looking out onto the road. Sally's eyebrows dropped. Daniel, she said. We have enough of books, don't we? he said, turning to face his wife. She was a narrow-shouldered woman with a lithe, delicate build and an inquisitive sort of face. Her hair was a mature blonde, and though the first sprouting of wrinkles had recently etched themselves on her face, they were mostly shallow and subtle. Even now, up this close, Dan couldn't see them. Under the bathing glow of a soft afternoon sun, Sally looked almost androgynous. I just want to have a look, she said. Maybe get something for Maria. She's entering another competition. Maria was their 14-year-old daughter, their only child. Sally puckered her lips as if to say something more, but retracted the breath. I've got to get the shopping in the car he said. He panted a little, as if to indicate the physical strain of such a task. He was holding two bags, each as light as pillows. She didn't say anything. She just stood there, her narrow eyes looking suspiciously over his face and body like a helicopter searchlight. Then she spoke. She had been planning her words carefully in her head. We've been shopping, she said. It's been hard. It's always an operation with you. Efficient, get what we need, and that's fine. She leant over and clasped his hand. Her hand was cold, like meat out of the refrigerator, but then he supposed so was his. He returned her grip and met her eyes. But now, she said, I want to have a little stroll in the bookshop with you. It will be nice. Dan held his gaze, then shrugged his shoulders and relented. What choice really did he have? What plausible excuse for not entering and lingering inside this tiny bookshop? Later, he knew, he'd come up with a dozen good reasons he could have deployed, but this would be as good as collating expired coupons. For now, there was nothing, no words, or at least no good ones. He followed his wife inside. The door made its terrible chime. 
Relief coursed through him when he saw who was working behind the counter. She was a tiny elderly lady in a blue cardigan, and she had that funny way of wearing her glasses way down on the tip of her nose. She gave them a warm, almost fey smile when they came in and then returned to whatever she was doing at the desk. Eileen. He was fairly certain that was her name. Luke had told him a bit about her. Her son had died in a motorbike accident about five years ago. Dan followed his wife around the shop, his eyes roaming the clutter of shelves. This is where books come to die, he thought. Sally stopped in front of a shelf labelled 19th Century Classics. The label was a faded, handwritten scribble sellotaped to the old oak. Dan squinted. He wondered if it was Luke's handwriting. He imagined Luke in one of his loose shirts, leaning over and pressing the paper against the wood. He closed his eyes and clenched his fists. The shopping bag handles were damp with sweat. A middle-aged man with hollow cheeks and serious eyes was hovering close by. He was the only other customer in the shop. When he walked past them, Sally said, I just love the smell, and then looked at Dan. Don't you? Sally loved saying things like this around strangers, trying to spark up some kind of spontaneous conversation. This isn't a film, Dan thought, gritting his teeth. The man darted his eyes awkwardly before turning his attention to a nearby shelf. Yeah, I do, Dan said. But he didn't like the old book smell at all. It was, it was like a parody, a bad parody of vanilla. Vanilla's cousin wired up to a hospital bed reeking of death. He shuddered and walked towards another shelf. Then he heard a low, monstrous rumble from somewhere on the road. In a blur, a motorbike soared past the shop like something propelled out of a rocket. Dan couldn't help it. His eyes darted towards Eileen, whose face had momentarily darkened. Sally tutted. No wonder they're always getting hurt, she said, and she said it so that everyone in the shop could hear. Dan grimaced. He could have hit her. He could have seriously thrown her into a bookshelf. Don't say that, he said, trying to keep his mouth as still as possible. His eyes fixed on Eileen, who was looking down at her desk again. What's you got you all worked up? Sally said. Stop it, he said, shaking his head. He bent forwards to inspect a row of books, but his eyes were glazing over everything. He heard the serious man leave the shop. You've been very funny today, Daniel, she said, and she said that quietly. They didn't say anything else to each other. Sally took her time picking out a handful of poetry books for Maria. When she was satisfied with her selections, she walked over to the counter, and Dan lingered aimlessly in the middle of the shop, thinking deeply. He had this feeling like big things were coming. I hate to see you two lovebirds arguing, Eileen said as Sally placed the books down on the counter. Little intrusive, Dan thought. But then he supposed not totally out of line with what Luke had said about her. I'm not sure about lovebirds, Sally said and then laughed. The laugh was louder than it ever was at home. Dan wandered to the door and looked out at what was now the creeping greyness of the evening. You're too young to be arguing, Eileen said. And my shop has a strict no-arguments policy. Young, Sally said. Is forty young? I'm not so sure. Her voice seemed to taper off. Now don't you be silly now, Eileen said, bagging up the books. You're still babies. That's nine ninety-five, my love. Dan heard Sally unzipping her purse. He exhaled deeply. Final hurdle now. And then... Sally said it. She simply could not resist. 
Is Luke not working today then? She said. Dan tried to calm himself. He took a deep breath. He knew it was wrong to get angry at her. She was, after all, blameless in all of this. And if Luke was in today, Dan could always just bolt out of the door. He's just out back, Eileen said, and Dan knew then that he wasn't going anywhere. Do you know him? I do, Sally said, which of course was a ridiculous statement. If Sally knew anything about Luke, but Dan brushed off the thought. I'd love to chat with him if he's free. Oh, I'm sure he's free, Eileen said, hobbling towards the storeroom. He was meant to be on the till now, anyway, she called out in mock anger. Hey, where are you, you little slacker? There was a long, pregnant silence. Dan was no longer looking out onto the road. He was looking at the doorway in which Eileen was standing. A hundred sensations danced around his body, and he could make sense of none. He felt he was being pulled in every direction. Luke appeared in the doorway, wearing a voluminous white shirt with half of the top buttons unfastened. His chest was slight and tanned lightly. He saw Sally and smiled. When he saw Dan, the smile went away. Their eyes stayed on each other, and as embarrassing as it was, as soul-destroying and unexplainable, as foreign and mawkish and hell, even downright childish, Luke, in the dim, half-shadowed light of this drab old bookshop, appeared to Dan as something beyond angelic, someone essential and inevitable and utterly complete in ways that Dan could not even begin to understand and in many ways did not want to. Eileen slapped Luke's shoulder. Right, she says, uh, I'm going to have a break, if you wouldn't mind seeing to this lady. Of course, Luke said, as Eileen slid past him. Her humming waned as she disappeared into the storeroom. Just the three of them now. Sally, Luke said. Hey, Luke, she said, have you met my husband? Dan had walked over so that he was standing next to his wife. He supposed it would look more natural this way. Dan held out his hand and introduced himself. Luke eyed him cautiously for a moment before obliging. Those scrutinising blue eyes set in a slim, elfin face. Dan held the urge to scream. Nice to meet you, Luke said keeping Dan's hand locked in his own. His eyes glimmered with something that didn't seem so friendly. Dan tried to work him out. They hadn't seen each other in a couple of weeks. OK, so Dan had been busy. That was what he'd said on the phone. I'm too busy right now. I'm just too busy. They let go of each other and Luke turned his attention to Sally. Dan found that he did not like this, but what could he do? Take Luke by the shoulders and push him to the wall and attack the smooth candy skin on his neck and chest, right there in front of, of his wife? Nonsense thoughts. Stupid. Today was a good day to start shaking the whole mess off. It's Maria. Sally said she's entering another competition. That's great, Luke said. He ran a hand through the tousled black hair that lay over most of his forehead. Does she want me to look over them, like last time? She would love that, Sally said. But also, I've been thinking about something. You could do with some extra cash, couldn't you? This didn't sound good. This was new. Luke's eyes flashed towards Dan for a second and then back at Sally. Of course, he said. Anything I can get. When are you back at uni? Sally said. October. Two months, she said, nodding. How would you feel about coming over and giving Maria some masterclass sessions? Say, 
once a week. Then Sally did one of her laughs, as if she, or indeed anyone, had said something amusing. Dan felt himself vocalising, but no real words came out of his mouth, only a strained, broken kind of moan. He took a heavy breath and found that the vaguely aquatic scent of Luke's perfume had now taken over the shop. It had been applied recently. Did you say something? Sally said. Dan shook his head, peering down at the rich grey carpet. Sally tutted softly, but a talked nonetheless a tut and gave out a sigh. This is what I mean, she said to Luke. This is what I was talking about on Tuesday. The man can't express himself. Dan knew he should have felt slighted by that, that it was a vicious, unprecedented assault that his wife had just launched at him, but he was unable to summon any meaningful emotion. He searched his stomach for rage, even a pang would do, but found he was stagnant. He fixed his eyes on Luke's trainers, which were a scuffed and faded white. It was something Luke had been saying more recently, or at least words to that effect, that he should be more open, that he needed to let it all come out like a great spew of vomit, green and marriage-breaking. Sally said, Sorry, Luke, and then she whispered, My husband, at him, as if that alone was somehow wholly informative. It's okay, Luke said. I understand. He's so muted, she said. She was talking as if Dan wasn't there. Dan was suddenly convinced that this was all calculated, that she had wanted to humiliate him today in front of her new friend. Oh, to be with a poet. I want you to give Maria those lessons, Luke. I'll pay kindly, and I'll pay double if you give my husband some lessons as well. Luke laughed awkwardly. The sound wrenched something deep inside Dan's gut. He thought back to the times that Luke had laughed like that, exactly like that, the sound purely his, utterly authentic. In the past few months, Luke resting on Dan's shoulder, his head rising and falling with the movement of his chest, the steady warmth of his breath streaming against Dan's bare, aging skin. Dan clenched his jaw and forced his eyes onto the young man. Perhaps sensing Dan's intensity, Luke's eyes shifted from Sally to Dan, Dan to Sally. I'll certainly think about it, he said. He giggled a little, the sound breathless, devoid of any real humour. Dan remembered himself. He remembered that he needed to shake this whole thing off. He jerked his head as if trying to stay awake and shifted his attention away from Luke's face. He studied his wife in the grey dim of the bookshop. He said, Are you sure we can afford that? His mind seethed with the idea of Luke. Luke in his house, sitting on his chairs, breathing his presence into every room, every wall. He shifted his weight from foot to foot, the shopping bags lapping against his calves. Sally gave him a look like he'd just insulted her. She craned her neck back and jutted her chest like a pale, featherless peacock. Just what is it with you, Daniel? she said. I don't know what you mean, he said. You clearly have something against Maria's poetry. What do you have against poetry, Daniel? Dan balked at her. He was simply baffled by the conclusion that his wife had come to. He said... I have nothing against poetry. What are you talking about? It makes you uncomfortable, she said. I can tell. I'm not uncomfortable, he said. He felt Luke staring at him. Oh, funny, she said. Funny, that's funny. She turned back towards Luke. This is what I mean. Have you ever met someone so inexpressive? It wasn't always like this, you know. 
really, Luke said, and there was something plaintive in his voice. And then he said calmly, I guess it's not really any of my business. Dan glared at him. No, he said, it's not. Sally gasped. Don't talk to him like that, she said. She tilted her head as if looking at her husband for the first time. How dare you? How bloody dare you? Dan and Luke were locked in onto each other. Luke's eyes shimmered with a new steely intransigence. Dan huffed. He shook the shopping bags like there was something inside them he was trying to wake up. I'm going, he said. It's been long enough. Not till you apologise for that, Sally said. I'm not apologising, Dan said. I wouldn't have expected you to, said Luke. His voice was measured, and though his eyes had taken on a dark, weary heaviness, his face was subdued, muted. Talking to Luke like that, Sally said. The cheek of it, what's wrong with you? Just what in hell is wrong with you? Have you ever considered, Dan said, turning to her, that maybe not everyone is your friend? He stood looming over his wife, watched the shadows of evening as they crept onto her small, stunned face, that maybe not everyone wants to talk to you or hear what you have to say about things, that maybe you don't know anyone or anything like you think you do. Her breathing was heavy. She fluttered her eyes away from him and squinted at a far-off bookshelf, as if searching for something on it that would let her undo her husband's words. But Dan wasn't finished. He said to both of them, How's that for expressive? He flung his bags onto the floor, kicked a stack of books. How's that for expressive? Huh? Luke said, I think you should leave. But isn't this what you wanted? Dan said. He was aware in a detached sort of way that he was in something of a frenzy. Isn't this what you both wanted? Sally kept looking at the shelves, finding nothing. I don't want this, Luke said. A single tear rolled down his cheek. His eyes were wet, dazzling, bright with pain. Dan felt something twinge inside of him. He was suddenly shocked with himself. He looked down at his hands and body as though they had been taken over by a foreign vessel. I don't want this at all, Luke said again, his voice trembling. The three of them stood there. A hazy greyness was filling up the room. Sally, Dan realised, was sobbing quietly. And to think she had only seen a glimpse. She had only seen a glimpse of how things were. Somewhere, far away, a motorbike engine hummed. Dan wondered what would happen if the bike were to come soaring past. He wondered if his wife would be silent. I was really happy and uh, surprised to win this award and I'd like to thank Catherine Mezzacapa for choosing me to be the uh, winner. Um, this story came about last year while I was studying for uh, a master's in creative writing at the University of Warwick and the story is really influenced by both the things I was reading at the time but also the kinds of things that my teachers were talking about. What I wanted to do was to have these three characters who all essentially want the same thing and who all love each other um, to battle it out within an enclosed space. And that space ended up being a, a bookshop. Um, and I suppose in many ways, it's a conventional love triangle dynamic going on. But also I wanted to have a protagonist who is who is really divided internally, but is barely conscious of the ways in which he is divided and as a consequence of that ends up lashing out. Um, and he, also a protagonist who um, has to make a, a, a terrible choice and no matter what he chooses, he's gonna lose either way. And again, 
those kind of ideas that are present in the story were really influenced by the kinds of things I was learning at work. So I'm greatly in, indebted to them. Um, it's also quite influenced by Carver, this story, Raymond Carver, perhaps to the point of being a little bit derivative. Um, but I was reading a lot of Carver at the time. And so I suppose I'm greatly indebted to his work as well, because it really influenced me um, in a positive way, I hope. So thank you again. And congratulations to all of the other award winners and, and everyone who submitted. Thank you.